This is the Sabbath School lesson for the fourth quarter, 2020. Lesson 3 for October 10 to 16, ready for teaching on Sabbath, October 17. The Law as Teacher. Sabbath afternoon, October 10. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, once again, as we open your word, we know that we depend on you. And we ask that your Holy Spirit be present with each of us who are listening, that your word will speak to us, that we may see the law as a teacher, and that as we open your word, that we may gain insights that will help us share the great love of Jesus with those about us. We pray in his dear name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 5. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Let's read that again. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 5. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. In warning the Galatians against legalism, Paul wrote in Galatians 3.21, For if there had been a law given which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. Of course, if any law could have given life, it would have been God's law. And yet, Paul's point is that for us as sinners, even God's law can't give life. Why? Because the next verse says... But the scripture has confined all under sin, that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. However, if the law can't give life to sinners, what's the purpose of it, other than to show us our need of grace? Is the law then only negative in function, only there to show us our sins? No, The law also is there to point us to the way of life, which is found only in Jesus. This also is what true education should be about, pointing us to a life of grace, of faith and of obedience to Christ. That's why this week we will study the role of God's law in the whole question of Christian education. As we do, let's see what the law, though it cannot save us, still can teach us about faith, about grace, and about our God's love for fallen humanity. Sunday, October 11. To love and to fear God. The book of Deuteronomy contains Moses' last words to Israel before a new generation will finally enter the promised land. But, before they do, he has some very clear words and instructions for them. Question, read Deuteronomy 31, verses 9 to 13. What does it mean to fear the Lord? Deuteronomy chapter 31, beginning at verse 9. So Moses wrote down this law and gave it to the Levitical priests, who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and to all the elders of Israel. Then Moses commanded them, At the end of every seven years, in the year for cancelling debts, during the festival of tabernacles, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God at the place he will choose, you shall read this law before them, in their hearing. Assemble the people, men, women, and children, and the foreigners residing in your towns, so that they can listen and learn to fear the Lord your God and follow carefully all the words of this law. Their children, who do not know this law, must hear it and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land you are crossing the Jordan to possess. God was intentional about the ways that he imparted his law to Israel. He made every provision so that his laws would not be forgotten. In this way, God is a long-suffering educator. 
He teaches and repeats and sends prophets and uses his servants to impart his message. And he did it again and again. Indeed, isn't so much of the writing of the Old Testament nothing but God seeking to teach his people to follow the way of life? Notice in these verses how Moses stresses the importance of future generations learning the law. Moses describes it as a two-step process. First, the children will hear the law, and then they will, as it says in verse 13, learn to fear the Lord your God. First, they hear, and then they learn to fear God. That is, learning the law presupposes that fear will not be a natural outcome of knowing the law. The process of fearing God must be learned. Moses implies that knowledge and fear are a process, not an immediate cause and effect relationship. Also, what does fear God mean when the people also are told that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength? Deuteronomy 6 verse 5. Perhaps we can compare it to the way a child loves and fears a good father, a father who reveals his love and care by showing that he says what he means and he means what he says. With such a father, if you do wrong, you will indeed suffer the consequences of that wrongdoing. Yes, we can and must love and fear God at the same time. They are not contradictory ideas. The more we learn about God, the more we come to love Him because of His goodness. And yet, at the same time, the more we come to know about God, the more we can fear Him too, because we can see just how holy and righteous He is, and how sinful and unrighteous we are in contrast, and how it is only by grace, undeserved merit, that we are not destroyed. So, to finish today... How do you understand what it means to love and to fear God at the same time? Monday, October 12. A witness against you. And this week's lesson is read from somewhere very special to me. Currently, my wife and I are travelling around Queensland and Australia in our caravan, and we're camped at Mount Isa in Queensland, way up to the very far northwest. And right now, I'm recording this lesson at Lake Mundara, the water supply for. Mount Isa. It's a magnificent lake and as I look out from the pavilion where I'm doing this I can uh, see beautiful flat water, uh, treed landscapes with uh, rugged cliffs around about, trees lining the edge and uh, in this particular park there are about 20 peacocks. You may hear them occasionally as I read but also in the background you may hear the voices of people who are picnicking in the area. But let's get back to God's word. When Moses knows he is soon to die, he is profoundly aware of the situation that he will leave behind. He knows that after his death, the Israelites will enter into the promised land of Canaan. He also knows that they will become rebellious upon reaching their long-sought destination. Question. Read Deuteronomy chapter 31, verses 17 to... Sorry, verses 14 to 27. What preparations does Moses make before his death? What were Moses' chief concerns? And how does he address those concerns? Deuteronomy chapter 31, verses 14 to 27. Predictions of Israel's Rebellion Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, the days approach when you must die. Call Joshua and present yourselves in the tabernacle of meeting, that I may inaugurate him. So Moses and Joshua went and presented themselves in the tabernacle of meeting. Now the Lord appeared at the tabernacle in a pillar of cloud, and the pillar of cloud stood above the door of the tabernacle. 
And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, you will rest with your fathers, and this people will rise and play the harlot with the gods of the foreigners of the land, where they go to be among them, and they will forsake me and break my covenant, which I have made with them. Then my anger shall be aroused against them in that day, and I will forsake them, and I will hide my face from them, and they shall be devoured, and many evils and troubles shall befall them, so that they will say in that day, Have not these evils come upon us, because our God is not among us? And I will surely hide my face in that day, because of all the evil which they have done, in that they turned to other gods. Now therefore write down this song for yourselves and teach it to the children of Israel. Put it in their mouths that this song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel when I have brought them to the land flowing with milk and honey of which I swore to their fathers and they have eaten and filled themselves and grown fat. Then they will turn to other gods and serve them, and they will provoke me and break my covenant. Then it shall be, when many evils and troubles have come upon them, that this song will testify against them as a witness, for it will not be forgotten in the mouths of their descendants. For I know the inclination of their behaviour today, even before I have brought them to the land of which I swore to give them. Therefore Moses wrote this song the same day, and taught it to the children of Israel. Then he inaugurated Joshua the son of Nun, and said, Be strong and of good courage, for you shall bring the children of Israel into the land of which I swore to them, and I will be with you. So it was, when Moses had completed writing the words of the law in a book, when they were finished, that Moses commanded the Levites who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, saying, Take this book of the law, and put it beside the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there as a witness against you. For I know your rebellion and your stiff neck. If today, while I am yet alive with you, you have been rebellious against the Lord, then how much more after his death? Moses' tone here may appear like that of a teacher preparing for a substitute. He knows that his pupils have misbehaved in his presence in the classroom. He is not so deluded as to think that they will not rebel in his absence. He instructs the Levites who carried the Ark of the Covenant and placed the Book of the Law next to the Ark in front in order for it to be a witness. Moses is not simply passing on a lesson plan for his substitute. He is passing on a witness. Moses speaks of the law the Book of the Law as though it is a living being with power to reprove the hearts of men. Think about the law as a witness against them. How do we understand this idea of the New Testament as well? See Romans 3, 19-23. That is, how does the law point us to our need of grace? Romans 3, beginning at verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ, to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In Deuteronomy 31, God instructs Moses to write down a song that the Lord has taught Moses. Moses is then to teach the song to the Israelites, so that as stated in verse 19, it may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. Again, we see God's directives personified. A song, when sung, is more easily shared and spread. And when a song is a witness, it has the ability to cause people to look at themselves and see what it says about them. And so, to finish today, even as we seek to obey God's law with all our God-given strength, in what ways does his law function as a witness against us? What does this witness teach us about the need of the gospel in our lives?
Tuesday, October 13, that you may prosper. Throughout the Bible, we hear of other outcomes of knowing and obeying God's law. Question. Read Joshua chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. What was the Lord saying to Joshua, and how do the principles found there apply to us today? Joshua 1, beginning at verse 7, Only be strong and very courageous, that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. The Lord tells Joshua as he enters into Canaan, Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. That was Joshua 1 verse 7. This notion of success as a byproduct of obedience may seem contrary to the way success is measured in our world today. Many today believe that the marks of success are innovation, creativity and self-reliance. To succeed in a particular industry often requires extraordinary talent and risk-taking. However, in God's eyes, success requires a different set of resources. Question. Read Revelation 12.17, 14.12, and Romans 1.5 and 16.26, and James 2.10-12. What are these verses saying to us today about obedience to God's law? That is, even if we are not saved by obeying God's law, why is it so important that we keep it? Revelation 12 verse 17 And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And Revelation 14.12 Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And Romans 1 verse 5 Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. And Romans 16 verse 26 But now, made manifest and by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, for obedience to the faith. And James 2 verses 10 to 12. For whoever shall keep the whole law, and yet stumble at one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said, Do not commit adultery, also said, Do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak, and so do, as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. Old Testament, New Testament. Old Covenant, New Covenant. It doesn't matter. As Bible-believing Christians, we are called to obedience to God's law. Violation of the law, also known as sin, can lead only to pain, suffering and eternal death. Who hasn't learned for themselves or seen for themselves the results of sin, the results of violation of God's law? Just as ancient Israel would prosper by obeying God's law, even though they needed grace as well, it's no different for us today either. Hence, as part of Christian education, we need to keep God's law as a central component of what it means to live by faith and trusting in God's grace. So, to finish the day, what has been your own experience with the consequences of sin? What have you learned that you could share with others so that perhaps they might not make the same mistakes? Wednesday, October 14. 
The Toils and Struggles of Law Keepers There are great benefits to following God's law as evidenced in the people whom God prospered. Joshua closely followed God's precepts, and he led the people of Israel well. Time and again the Lord told Israel that if they obeyed the law, they would prosper. Question. Read Second Chronicles 31, verses 20 and 21. What were the key reasons in this passage as to why Hezekiah prospered? Second Chronicles 31, beginning at verse 20. Thus Hezekiah did throughout all Judah, and he did what was good, and right, and true, before the Lord his God. And in every work that he began in the service of the house of God, in the law and in the commandment to seek his God, he did it with all his heart. So he prospered. Whatever education venue we are in, we must stress the importance of obedience. Yet our students aren't stupid. They will notice sooner or later the harsh fact that some people are faithful, loving and obedient. And yet what? Disaster strikes them as well. How do we explain this? The fact is we can't. We live in a world of sin, of evil, a world in which the great controversy rages, and none of us are immune to it. Question, what do these texts teach us about this difficult situation? Mark six twenty five to twenty seven, Job chapter one and chapter two, and Second Corinthians eleven verses twenty three to twenty nine. Beginning at Mark six and verse twenty five, immediately she came in with haste to the king and asked, saying, "I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter." And the king was exceedingly sorry. Yet because of the oaths and because of those who sat with him, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately the king sent an executioner and commanded his head to be brought, and he went and beheaded him in prison. Job chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright and one who feared God and shunned evil. And seven sons and three daughters were born to him. Also his possessions were seven thousand sheep, three thousand camels, five hundred yoke of oxen, five hundred female donkeys, and a very large household, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the east. And his sons would go and feast in their houses, each on his appointed day, and would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. So it was when the days of feasting had run their course, that Job would send and sanctify them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did regularly. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for anything? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power, only Do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were ploughing and the donkeys feeding beside them, when the Sabaeans raided them and took them away. Indeed, they have killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, 
The fire of God fell from heaven and burnt up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The Chaldeans formed three bands, raided the camels, and took them away, yes, and killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, and suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people, and they are dead, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Then Job arose, tore his robe, and shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and worshipped, and he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. Chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. Again there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil, and still he holds fast to his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without cause? So Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin. Yes, all that a man has he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand, but spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with painful boils, from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took for himself a potsherd with which to scrape himself while he sat in the midst of the ashes. Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God and shall we not accept adversity? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Now, when Job's three friends heard of all this adversity that had come upon him, each one came from his own place, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuite, and Zophar the Namathite, for they had made an appointment together to come and mourn with him and to comfort him. And when they raised their eyes from afar and did not recognize him, they lifted their voices and wept. And each one tore his robe and sprinkled dust on his head toward heaven. So they sat down with him on the ground seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his grief was very great. And Second Chronicles chapter 11, beginning at verse 23. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more, in labours more abundant, in stripes more me above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. From the Jews five times I received forty stripes minus one, three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked, a night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides the other things, what comes upon me daily? My deep concern for all the churches. Who is weak, and I am not weak? Who is made to stumble, and I do not burn with indignation? Without question, good and faithful people, law-abiding people, 
have not always prospered, at least as the world understands prosperity. And here too might be a partial answer to this difficult question, a question that, as we seek to teach the importance of the law, is no doubt going to be raised. What exactly do we mean by prosperity? What did the psalmist say in Psalm 84.10? I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. There's no question that, by the world's standard, even those faithful to God and obedient to His law don't always prosper, at least for now. We do our students a disservice to say otherwise. And to finish today... Read Hebrews 11, verses 13 to 16. How do these verses help us understand why those who are faithful still suffer in this life? Hebrews 11, beginning at verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they see a homeland, and truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He has prepared a city for them." Thursday, October 15. Jesus, our example. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, lived the only human life in perfect obedience to the Father, in perfect obedience to the law of God. He did this so that he could be not just our substitute, which he was, but also our example, which he was too. Question. Read the following passages, Luke 2, 51 and 52, Philippians 2, 8, Hebrews 5, 8, and John 8, verses 28 and 29. How do they remind us of Christ's obedience throughout his life? Luke 2, beginning at verse 51, Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth, and was subject to them. But his mother kept all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature, and in favour with God and men. And Philippians 2, verse 8, And, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. And Hebrews 5, verse 8, Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And John 8, beginning at verse 28, Then Jesus said to them, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father taught me, I speak these things. And he who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I always do those things that please him. Perhaps John said it the best when he wrote this in 1 John 2 verse 6. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. When we fix our eyes on the life of Christ and his ministry on earth, it is easy to see how he pleased the Father by his obedience. Christ did fulfil prophecy and he upheld God's laws throughout his lifetime. Just as God told Moses to write down his law so that it might be a witness to Israel, Christ was the living embodiment of the witness to his apostles, disciples, to sinners and saints. Now, rather than just having a set of rules to follow, we have the example of Jesus, a flesh and blood human being, to follow as well. As teachers, what better role model can we present to students than the model of Jesus and how he obeyed the Father? From that lovely little book, 
Steps to Christ, page 61, we read, That so-called faith in Christ, which professes to release men from the obligation of obedience to God, is not faith, but presumption. By grace are ye saved through faith, but faith, if it hath not works, is dead, Ephesians 2, verse 8, and James 2, verse 17. Jesus said of himself before he came to earth, I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is within my heart, Psalm 40, verse 8. And, just before he ascended again to heaven, he declared, I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love, John fifteen ten. The scripture says, Hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk even as he walked. 1 John chapter 2 verses 3 to 6 and that's the end of the quote. So to finish today, what can you do to better follow Christ's example in all areas of your life and thus be a better teacher to others as well? Though it's kind of an old trite idea, why does what we do, our actions, speak so much louder than what we say? Friday, October 16. From the book Education, page 16, we read, Love, the basis of creation and of redemption, is the basis of true education. This is made plain in the law that God has given as the guide of life. The first and great commandment is, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind. To love him, the infinite one, the omniscient one, with the whole strength and mind and heart, means the highest development of every power. It means that in the whole being, the body, the mind, as well as the soul, the image of God is to be restored. Like the first is the second commandment, Thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. The law of love calls for the devotion of body, mind and soul to the service of God and our fellow men. And this service, while making us a blessing to others, brings the greatest blessings to ourselves. Unselfishness underlies all true development. Through unselfish service, we receive the highest culture of every faculty— More and more fully do we become partakers of the divine nature. We are fitted for heaven, for we receive heaven into our hearts. End of quote. And that brings us to our four discussion questions for this week. One, like Israel of old, we are to love God and to fear God at the same time. We read that in Matthew 27. Matthew 22, verse 37. Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And Revelation chapter 14, verse 7. Saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of waters. In class, talk more about how we can do both. Also answer the question, why are these two commandments not in conflict with each other? 2. What is the difference between setting a standard and making a rule? In your experience, is Adventism more concerned with setting high standards within the community of believers or in making rules that unite its community? What does Scripture say about setting high standards for oneself, one's family, one's church? 3. How do we strike the right balance in showing the importance of obedience to the law of God and, at the same time, showing why this obedience is not the source of our salvation? And 4. Read through Psalm 119 and note how many times notions of obedience, freedom, laws, rules and commands are stated. 
What does the author of Psalm 119 want to convey with these themes? And I'm going to read Psalm 119. I've never read it out loud before, right through the 174 verses. But let's try. Beginning at verse 1. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with the whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. You have commanded us to keep your precepts diligently. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep your statutes. Then I would not be ashamed when I look into all your commandments. I will praise you with uprightness of heart when I learn your righteous judgments. I will keep your statutes. Oh, do not forsake me utterly. How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word I have hidden in my heart, that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I have declared all the judgments of your mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies, as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and contemplate your ways. I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Deal bountifully with your servant, that I may live and keep your word. Open my eyes, that I may see wondrous things from your law. I am a stranger in the earth. Do not hide your commandments from me. My soul breaks with longing for your judgments at all times. You rebuke the proud, the cursed, who stray from your commandments. Remove from me reproach and contempt, for I have kept your testimonies. Princes also sit and speak against me, but your servant meditates on your statutes. Your testimonies also are my delight and my counsellors. My soul clings to the dust. Revive me according to your word. I have declared my ways, and you answered me. Teach me your statutes. Make me understand the way of your precepts. So shall I meditate on your wonderful works. My soul melts with heaviness. Strengthen me according to your word. Remove from me the way of lying and grant me your law graciously. I have chosen the way of truth. Your judgments I have laid before me. I cling to your testimonies. O Lord, do not put me to shame. I will run the course of your commandments, for you shall enlarge my heart. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I shall keep it to the end. Give me understanding, and I shall keep your law. Indeed, I shall observe it with my whole heart. Make me walk in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Incline my heart to your testimonies, and not to covetousness. Turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things, and revive me in your way. Establish your word to your servant, who is devoted to fearing you. Turn away my reproach, which I dread, for your judgments are good. Behold, I long for your precepts. Revive me in your righteousness. Let your mercies come also to me, O Lord, your salvation according to your word. So shall I have an answer for him who reproaches me, for I trust in your word. And take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth, for I have hoped in your ordinances. So shall I keep your law continually, for ever and ever." And I will walk at liberty, for I seek your precepts. I will speak of your testimonies also before kings. I will not be ashamed, and will delight myself in your commandments, which I love. My hands also I will lift up to your commandments, which I love, and I will meditate on your statutes. Remember the word of your servant, upon which you have caused me to hope. This is my comfort in my affliction, for your word has given me life. The proud have me in great derision, yet I do not turn aside from your law. I remembered your judgments of old, O Lord, and have comforted myself. Indignation has taken hold of me because of the wicked who forsake your law. Your statutes have been my songs in the house of my pilgrimage. I remember your name in the night, O Lord, and I keep your law. 
This has become mine, because I kept your precepts. You are my portion, O Lord. I have said that I would keep your word. I entreated your favour with my whole heart. Be merciful to me according to your word. I thought about my ways and turned my feet to your testimonies. I made haste and did not delay to keep your commandments. The cords of the wicked have bound me, but I have not forgotten your law. At midnight I will rise to give thanks to you because of your righteous judgments. I am a companion of all who fear you and of those who keep your precepts. The earth, O Lord, is full of your mercy. Teach me your statutes. You have dealt well with your servant. O Lord, according to your word, teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I believe your commandments. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. You are good and do good. Teach me your statutes. The proud have forged the lie against me, but I will keep your precepts with my whole heart. Their heart is as fat as grease, but I delight in your law. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of coins of gold and silver. Your hands have made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. Those who fear you will be glad when they see me, because I have hoped in your word. I know, O Lord, that your judgments are right, and that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. Let, I pray, your merciful kindness be for my comfort, according to your word to your servant. Let your tender mercies come to me that I may live, for your law is my delight. Let the proud be ashamed, for they treated me wrongfully with falsehood, but I will meditate on your precepts. Let those who fear you turn to me, those who know your testimonies. Let my heart be blameless regarding your statutes, that I may not be ashamed. My soul faints for your salvation, but I hope in your word. My eyes fail from searching your word, saying, When will you comfort me? For I have become like a wineskin in smoke. Yet I do not forget your statutes. How many are the days of your servant? When will you execute judgment on those who persecute me? The proud have dug pits for me, which is not according to your law. All your commandments are faithful. They persecute me wrongfully. Help me! They almost made an end of me on earth, but I did not forsake your precepts. Revive me according to your loving kindness, so that I may keep the testimony of your mouth. For ever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. You establish the earth, and it abides. They continue this day according to your ordinances, for all are your servants. Unless your law has been my delight, I would then have perished in my affliction. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have given me life. I am yours. Save me for I have sought your precepts. The wicked wait for me to destroy me, but I will consider your testimonies. I have seen the consummation of all perfection, but your commandment is exceedingly broad. Oh, how I love your law! It is my meditation all the day. You, through your commandments, make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients, because I keep your precepts. I have restrained my feet from every evil way, that I may keep your word. I have not departed from your judgments, for you yourself have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey in my mouth. Through your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I have sworn and confirmed that I will keep your righteous judgments. I am afflicted very much. Revive me, O Lord, according to your word. 
Accept, I pray, the free will offerings of my mouth, O Lord, and teach me your judgments. My life is continually in your hand, yet I do not forget your law. The wicked have laid a snare for me, yet I have not strayed from your precepts. Your testimonies I have taken as a heritage for ever, for they are the rejoicing of my heart. I have inclined my heart to perform your statutes for ever, to the very end. I hate the double-minded, but I love your law. You are my hiding place and my shield. I hope in your word, depart from me, you evildoers, for I will keep the commandments of my God. Uphold me according to your word that I may live, and do not let me be ashamed of my hope. Hold me up, and I shall be safe, and I shall observe your statutes continually. You reject all those who stray from your statutes, for their deceit is falsehood. You put away all the wicked of the earth like dross. Therefore, I love your testimonies. My flesh trembles for fear of you, and I am afraid of your judgments. I have done justice and righteousness. Do not leave me to my oppressors. Be surety for your servant for good. Do not let the proud oppress me. My eyes fail from seeing your salvation and your righteous word. Deal with your servant according to your mercy, and teach me your statutes. I am your servant. Give me understanding that I may know your testimonies. For it is time for you to act, O Lord, for they have regarded your law as void. Therefore I love your commandments more than gold, yes, than fine gold. Therefore all your precepts concerning all things I consider to be right. I hate every false way." Your testimonies are wonderful, therefore my soul keeps them. The entrance of your words gives light, it gives understanding to the simple. I opened my mouth and panted, for I longed for your commandments. Look upon me and be merciful to me, as your custom is toward those who love your name. Direct my steps by your word, and let no iniquity have dominion over me. Redeem me from the oppression of man, that I may keep your precepts. Make your face shine upon your servant, and teach me your statutes. Rivers of water run down from my eyes, because men do not keep your law. Righteous are you, O Lord, and upright are your judgments. Your testimonies which you have commanded are righteous and very faithful. My zeal has consumed me, because my enemies have forgotten your words. Your word is very pure, therefore your servant loves it. I am small and despised, yet I do not forget your precepts. Your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and your law is truth. Trouble and anguish have overtaken me, yet your commandments are my delights. The righteousness of your testimonies is everlasting. Give me understanding, and I shall live. I cry out with my whole heart. Hear me, O Lord, I will keep your statutes. I cry out to you, save me, and I will keep your testimonies. I rise before the dawning of the morning and cry for help. I hope in your word. My eyes are awake from the night watches, that I may meditate on your word. Hear my voice according to your loving kindness, O Lord. Revive me according to your justice. They draw near who follow after wickedness. They are far from your law. You are near, O Lord, and all your commandments are truth. Concerning your testimonies, I have known of old that you have founded them for ever. Consider my affliction and deliver me, for I do not forget your law. Plead my cause and redeem me. Revive me according to your word. Salvation is far from the wicked, for they do not seek your statutes. Great are your tender mercies, O Lord. Revive me according to your judgments. Many are my persecutors and my enemies, yet I do not turn from your testimonies. I see the treacherous and am disgusted, because they do not keep your word. Consider how I love your precepts. Revive me, O Lord, according to your loving kindness. The entirety of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. Princes persecute me without a cause, but my heart stands in awe of your word. 
I rejoice at your word as one who finds great treasure. I hate and abhor lying, but I love your law. Seven times a day I praise you because of your righteous judgments. Great peace have those who love your law, and nothing causes them to stumble. Lord, I hope for your salvation, and I do your commandments. My soul keeps your testimonies, and I love them exceedingly. I keep your precept and your testimonies, for all my ways are before you. Let my cry come before you, O Lord. Give me understanding according to your word. Let my supplication come before you. Deliver me according to your word. My lips shall utter praise, for you teach me your statutes. My tongue shall speak of your word, for all your commandments are righteousness. Let your hand become my help, for I have chosen your precepts. I long for your salvation, O Lord, and your law is my delight. Let my soul live, and it shall praise you, and let your judgments help me. And verse 176, I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. Inside Story. Our mission story this week is entitled Instructed by God in Brazil, and it's by Salamita Hamzoe. An aunt gave me a booklet filled with Bible verses on a Saturday afternoon. Just open the booklet and God will talk to you through a verse, she said. I hadn't thought about God in more than 20 years. Although I was raised in a Christian home in Brazil, I had stopped attending church when I was 16. Now I was wrapping up a month-long trip in Brazil as part of a research project for my university studies in France. I would leave for Paris the next day. I opened the booklet and my eyes fell on Proverbs 22 verse 19. So that your trust may be in the Lord, I have instructed you today, even you. The words moved me because I was a student and curious to know what God would teach. That evening I joined friends for a goodbye meal, but I couldn't get the Bible verse out of my mind, and I excused myself to go to church. Entering the church, I saw to my shock that every young woman was dressed like me in jeans, high heels, earrings and makeup. The music also had changed, and the pastor didn't make an altar call. I was waiting for the appeal. I wanted to give my heart to Jesus. I left disappointed. The next day I flew to France and prayed, Lord, even though they didn't make an altar call, I will find a church in France and attend services regularly. In France I found a church near my home and started to attend every Sunday. The people were kind, but I sensed that they were cold spiritually. I started studying the Bible at home, and I watched sermons online. I discovered a prominent Seventh-day Adventist preacher on YouTube who spoke powerfully about Revelation. I watched 25 of his sermons. One night I woke up around 3am and decided to pray until daybreak. The same thing happened the next night and the next As I prayed those three nights, I sensed that Jesus' return was near. I confessed my sins and praised God for his goodness. On the third day, peace filled my heart. I knew God lives. Although I had watched so many YouTube sermons, I didn't realize that the preacher was an Adventist. Wondering about his denomination, I found his personal testimony online. Immediately, I looked for the address of an Adventist church in Paris. On my first Sabbath, I was astonished to see people studying the Bible in Sabbath school. The women were dressed modestly, and the sermon was about revelation. God knew what was important for me. I wept during the worship service. I didn't think that this kind of church existed. God promised in Brazil to teach me, and I have been learning in France ever since. And it's a beautiful photo of this young lady who's written the story. 
Thank you for your Sabbath School mission offerings that help spread the gospel around the world. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind and Hearing Impaired, Christian Record Services for the Blind, the Sabbath School Department and Hope Channel. You can also listen on the official Sabbath School 4 app and the Apple iTunes app, Sabbath School with Percy Harold. Remember, God is always faithful.